Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, it's nice to see so many people here. I'm uh, Professor John Roberts, and I'm based at the University of Wolverhampton. And I am um, the... I'll get rid of this. Um, I'm the principal investigator for the project, so I've been working with, with Karen and her team and the other beneficiaries for almost two years now. Now, I imagine that um, some of you are fully aware of what fine art is and means, but I'll explain in a little, in a, in a little bit of detail about what we are and what we've achieved so far. Uh, fine art stands for the future of independent art spaces in Europe in a period of socially engaged art, and it's committed to the support of 11 PhDs to analyze and to assess the future of socially engaged art in Europe. Now, um, as I said, we have um, a number of researchers, 11 PhD students, who are working with us. And they're working on various aspects of socially engaged art. So some are working on socially engaged art and uh, uh, contemporary problems of democracy, art and philosophy. Some are working directly in relation to art theory. And some are working um, strictly um, uh, as curators and arts administrators. But um, what distinguishes the project as a whole is um, its interdisciplinarity. So if you are doing work on contemporary democracy and art, then you'll um, need to have some understanding of contemporary art theory and curating and arts administration. So this is what defines um, our, our project. And so we're, you know, we're grateful for Zeppelin to host this event. Uh, given COVID, we've only had, this is the second face-to-face -face event that we've organized. We organized a workshop in Iceland in March that was, that was successful, but hopefully this is going to be even more successful uh, given its, its ambitions. And um, given that, I'd like to say a big thank you again to Karm and the team, particularly to Rahul Spira um, and to Misofa Ursudel, who put in so much work over the last uh, year or so for this to, for this to happen. Um, um, I would also like to thank uh, the other beneficiaries, the University of um, Edinburgh, the University of Iceland, who have um, played a big role as well in the success of the project, and all the, the partner organizations. The partner organizations have played um, uh, an important and distinctive role in the success of the project, given that they have hosted the early stage researchers on, on various secondments up to a period of 10, 10 months. And so I'd like to thank State of Concept, and the BNL of Warsaw in, in Poland, Bach, Vessel, Transit in, in Romania, the Icelandic University of the Arts, and there's the Kunstal um, for, their, for their help. Um, now, what's important about their involvement is their uh, co com commitment to the overall training program of fine art, because this is not simply um, an academic training program. It's unusual insofar as it uh, incorporates non-academic um, skills into, into the overall structure. Now, so unlike most PhD programs, um, the, the students, or the ESRs as we call them, have had to do a lot of um, extra work, so to speak. There's been a great deal of pressure placed on them to complete various kinds of tasks. Uh, they've had to speak in colloquia, they've had to attend public lecture programs, they've had to travel to the secondments. And in some cases, um, the ESRs have traveled to three partner organizations to complete their secondments. So I'd say, again, a big thank you to all the ESRs who also have contributed enormously to the success of the project. Now, today, um, we're going to have you know, a very interesting uh, uh, range of events. We've got three keynote speakers. 
that um, uh, Karen will speak about in a moment, Elke Krasny, Karen Lurito, and Amusa Makubu, and also a number of workshops that um, are structured around some of the issues and problems that we've confronted as a group within, within the fi fine art program. So I'll leave the, um, the, the finer details of that to Karen. So again, thank you for all uh, coming, and I wish you well and a good day's thinking. Thanks. Thank you very much, John, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Mülhan, uh, to our president, for this warm welcome. Um, and thank you for um, being our uh, coordinator, uh, John. Uh, dear guests, dear colleagues, dear speakers, uh, it's a wonderful moment um, for all of us, I think, today. Um, and to have all of you here today. I'm, I'm grateful um, to all those who have contributed um, to our standing here. I'm not only looking forward to uh, the lectures, uh, the discussions, and working with all of you in the workshops. I'm also pleased that we have a room full of experts here today. So it's not only the experts from our program, but also the attendees who have um, yeah, amazing expertise in the field. So it's simply a wonderful moment standing here. Today is the 23rd of September, and it's beginning of autumn, as we all know. And we, sitting eagerly in this warm, dry, and beautiful campus, know that here in Europe, we have not experienced such an autumn as the one we are facing. Nevertheless, the planetary catastrophes that are rapidly approaching us have not yet fully arrived in our consciousness and in our way of life. We see the need to develop new economies, new forms of living, and working together in solidarity. We, need the need for, we see the need for new epistemies and um, a need for a new relationship to the world. <clears throat> Many activists, social movements, and theorists are therefore concerned with the following questions. How can we create new forms of governance? How can we develop new econo economic models and forms? How can new social and regenerative ecologies arise? What is the role of local communities and their specific knowledge? What role could institutions play in this? What knowledge do we need? And how do we want to learn to gain a different relationship to the world in general? And finally, what role could the arts play in driving such a radical transformation? What do art practices and projects look like that provide answers to this? What can socially engaged art achieve in that? And by socially engaged art, we mean those art practices that are characterized by two aspects. Firstly, in that they intervene directly in the social world beyond the museum exhibition nexus. And secondly, in that artists interact with another and with activists and with non-artistic and non-artist groups. So when we ask, what is the role of socially engaged art practice? An obvious answer might be that art plays an important role because it's about imagination, imagination uh, of another future, and about what is the between 
or what is about between the, the real and the fantastic. Or as Rancière puts it, art is between logos and pathos, knowledge and ignorance, meaning and meaninglessness, and thus ensures that reality does not continuously represent itself. Another but much more important answer for us here in this uh, context is that art has a potential to develop collective machines of desire and hope, to design alternative social forms, to create alternative local infrastructures. But it can also create productive modes of dispute and ways of translating individual desires and hopes into collective thoughts and action. The arts have increasingly evolved from an aesthetic regime, aesthetic regime of thoughts, to a form of poetic action. And this shift from aesthetics to poetic, poetic action, is the starting point of our project uh, and the summer school. We therefore want to explore with you which, which projects, work, working approaches, and new forms of thinking and acting have developed in recent years, and with which hopes, problems, and risks they are associated. This summer school will therefore provide insights into working methods, forms of thinking and acting, but also into the infrastructures of existing projects. This will take place in the form of workshops, lectures, and discussion, and discussion circles. In the following two days, theorists who deal with eco-social art practices will have their say, Elke Krasny will begin with the question, how do we think our lives in times without future? Carolina Rito sheds light on the crisis of exhibiting and the phenomenon that efforts for more inclusion go hand in hand with pushes towards neoliberalism. Nomusa Makubu's lecture will address questions of fluid solidarity, knowledge sharing, and forms of cultural normatism in Africa, in, in the African continent. Artists and theorists will work together in uh, the workshops. The workshops will focus on institution making, collective learning, on social e ecologies and care, on self-governance and commoning, and on local knowledge. The workshops will be led by Marina Lavajova, uh, Maria Lavalekova and um, Janne van Heeswijk, so it's the first workshop, and then Fahima Al-Nablisi um, with the second one, um, Massimo De Angelis, Marina Napushkina, and Miju, uh, the third one, and Christoph Schäfer and Margit Schenke, the fourth one, and by Alke Kresny and uh, Sunshine Wong, the fifth one. Fine arts PhD candidates will share experiences and observations they have made during their research so far in the form of short, very short, instant lectures and through interventions lasting only a few minutes. These short impressions are intended to open up the panorama of current projects and uh, topical issues. The focus of the summer school is on the question of institutionalization, social and organizational modes, and ways of knowledge productions in, uh, production in the field of socially engaged art. Since we also asked ourselves during the preparation, uh, which felt like um, having conversations 100 times, um, um, since we also have asked ourselves during the preparation how an academic event could look like which addresses this question, we also thought about the former itself. We would like to briefly, I would like to briefly introduce you uh, into two maybe a little bit unusual formats. Firstly, 
we will have only a very short a question and answer session after the keynote lectures. And afterwards, we will have um, dis five discussion circles. And we will be kind of strict uh, with the timeline. So uh, I have to apologize for that, because otherwise it wouldn't work. Uh, it's a little bit of uh, walking around in, in the campus as well. Afterwards, we will leave the large plenary and divide into four, five smaller discussion groups, which then have longer time for a discussion and uh, will document their, sh their results in short questions and mini statements. These will then be discussed again in the planetary on Saturday, moderated by Kuba Schreder. Um, who also was involved in the planning of this conference, so I have to say thank you, but he's not here there. Um, um, these panel discussion circles um, are intended to enable more participants to take part in the discussions. The allocation of the rooms, the five rooms, will be done by drawing a card with a room number when you simply leave the auditorium and you will be uh, directed to the respective uh, room. The second special format will be what we call the little pieces. You might have seen it on the program. Little pieces, messages from the field that the fine art PhD candidates will bring in. And I already said what they were for. And moreover, the summer school will also be enriched by three artistic contributions. One by Kai Ketizzi, who will cook for us tonight, together with a group of students. Uh, the DG uh, Trinity, uh, so we also try to celebrate a bit. And um, Claude Nassar on, on Saturday. The moderators will be colleagues from Fine Art mostly, and from the Fine Art Consortium and uh, two colleagues um, here from Zeppelin and a PhD candidate of mine who will replace um, some colleagues from the Fine Art Consortium who couldn't make it um, caused by COVID and what we all know about. And we would like to thank them with a very warm, uh, warmly uh, in advance and um, yeah, um, you will, you will meet different people, so we, you will meet a, a lot of people uh, during the conference, uh, moderators, and so on and so forth. And I would also like uh, to thank John Roberts, with whom we have been wrestling over this program for like um, months, <laughs> and um, the special formats uh, for many weeks. Uh, and finally, the entire preparation team, uh, which is already there, uh, especially uh, and um, most of all, uh, the curator of the arts program and this event, uh, Rahel Spürer, who's there. Can you please give a... Yeah. <laughs> but also the assistant, Marie-Sophie Usadel. So most of you have been in contact with those two. And my colleagues, uh, Philipp Klein-Michel and uh, Joachim Landkammer and the student assistants, Letizia Lücke, Niklas Ehret, and Ricarda Hohmann. So thank you so much for uh, doing all this work. <laughs> and I have to make one more announcement uh, that Ahmed Ojit couldn't make it, unfortunately, uh, today. So. Um, uh, the, the workshop uh, will just be guided by Fahima. And now, it's my pleasure to ask my colleague Angela Dimitrikati to introduce Elke Krasny. Thank you.
Um, Angela, I'm based at the University of Edinburgh, um, one of the universities collaborating uh, for this uh, project, for this very large and important uh, culturally uh, project on socially engaged art and independent art spaces. And um, it is, of course, my very uh, great uh, pleasure to be introducing Elke Krasne, who is... Um, it's also very hard because Elke is my friend and I wasn't supposed to be introducing her, but here I am, you know. <laughs> so, um, Elke is a professor of art and um, education at the Academy of Fine Arts in, in Vienna. And she is, um, she's a writer, um, a curator. She focuses for a long time now on, on, on care. Um, on, Yes. I think, uh, I think the microphone is not loud enough. I think you it's... can't hear me. I have a very loud voice. No. <laughs> okay. I think it's okay. the Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. So for those who didn't hear me, uh, I was saying that it's my great uh, pleasure and honor to be introducing LK, who is also um, a friend and. Um, based as a professor of art and education at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna. So um, she's an urbanist, a curator, um, a writer, and a feminist uh, politically. S her work has been, um, has focused on care, this um, perplexing concept, care, um, in a way that situates this concept in our historical uh, juncture conjuncture and of course as a feminist is, is interested in emancipation in the transformation of social relations so Elke is a critic of contemporary um, practice contemporary curatorial practice but she's also an optimist as far as I can tell <laughs> she sees the potential of reparation in many ways, he honors um, what an anthropologist defined, and it was very much in the news recently, so you may have heard of this, um, what an anthropologist called Margaret Mead defined as the beginning of human civilization. I think it was in the news in May. So I, lo I love the story, so I'm just going to repeat it here in case anybody missed it. So, um, yeah, years back, she was asked, this anthropologist, uh, what she considered to be the first sign of civilization. And she said that the first sign of the, the beginning of civilization in an ancient culture was a broken, a broken leg bone, a broken thigh bone that had been um, mended and healed. You've heard this story, right? No? Okay, so I'm very glad to be telling you. Um, and she explained that such um, healings uh, were never found in the remains of um, competitive savage societies because, you know, we're not the only one such society. There have been others. So, in those societies, she said, um, violence uh, was everywhere, it abounded. Um, you could see it in, in the remains, that is, uh, temples, I read, pierced, I quote now, pierced by arrows, skulls crossed by clubs. But the healed uh, leg bone, femur, it's called, uh, showed that someone um, had cared for the injured person, that someone handed on behalf of this person, that brought this person food and served this person at personal sacrifice where my quote stops. So the early sign of civilization was that the human being was not left to die, was not left behind. That's another interesting uh, expression very much involved in Brexit. You know, the land where I come from, the left behind, that would be doing well now. Um, so that someone was not left behind, that someone cared enough to produce caring and healing knowledge. Yet, it is uh, depressingly and ridiculously clear that the caring society and the competitive society, originally distinguished as two different societies by Margaret Mead, are now combined into our historical experience. 
the caring society and the cutthroat competition society are so naturalized in the way history is narrated um, that you will often hear that they express the complexity of human nature. Um, in fact, uh, the effort to naturalize this duality has gone so far as to be scripted into a human history as a gender divide, as you know, right? Masculinity is uh, competition and femininity is uh, servitude and care. So we should uh, therefore, I'm told, we should uh, give up on thinking of a society beyond cutthroat competition um, and just keep care as the principal and honored human bond because this thing is very old, it's always been with us. Therefore, it's part of our nature. So that's what we're told every day in different ways, some of them very brutal, demonstrative ways. Now, Elke does not want to give up on opting for care as the principal and honored human bond and crossing and combining disciplines and fields of knowledge mediated by the feminist inquiry, indeed by the complexity of the feminist inquiry, Elke is uh, making books with titles such as Curating as Feminist Organizing. Um, this is one to which I have contributed myself, I believe. So it's coming out from um, uh, Routledge this October, in a few days, presumably. Um, last year, I think, yeah, she uh, co-edited um, another volume called Radicalizing Care, Feminist and Queer Activism in Curating. And next, um, she is writing, and she's been writing it um, the whole summer, uh, infected, living with an infected planet, um, COVID-19 feminism and the global frontline of care, which I believe will also touch on this concept of, of war, which I'm sure most of you remember was here also during the pandemic as we're like at war with the virus, etc., etc. So, how does Elke work? Um, how does Elke work? I'll speculate on this. She works by reviewing, retrieving, and reviewing the marginal, and first by identifying it. So in 2017, uh, she published a great essay on the conversational complex. And um, as a feminized practice, that is discussion, right, dialogue, notable um, at least since the 90s in, um, in the art field, but neglected in the history of museum practice, and broadly speaking also in art history. Uh, this essay was called The Salon Model and has been a key text in the edited volume Feminism and Art History Now. If I make any mistakes, you correct me, okay. Um, how this relates to social practice or to socially engaged art uh, should be obvious, but maybe it's not obvious enough. So I uh, hope we have the chance with Elke to think through this. Uh, for me, um, the article that Elke contributed to um, Third Tech's special issue on art and social production, it was also back in 2017. The article um, called Exposed is also indicative of her way of working. So, uh, subtitled The Politics of Infrastructure in Valley Experts Transparent Space, uh, which is actually um, a work in Vienna, a public, uh, publicly installed work. So this article called Exposed, it looks at the contradictions of a cultural object which is a feminist artwork but also an exhibition space. And it asks why these contradictions exist. Because artworks and feminist politics exist in overt and covert economic histories is the way I read. Um, I read this, um, uh, Elke's thoughts on this and her article. And Artworks and feminist politics are articulated in specific moments in the history of value, which is another way of looking at the history of art, which dictates that corporate workspaces are meticulously cleaned by armies of laborers, but that public feminist art spaces are maintained by their users. <laughs> that is, the artists 
much like a squat, you know, like if you have experience of squats, that you take care of your, of your place. Um, so this is how histories of the public become forced histories of the commons. Right, the, in this very famous distinction between public and um, public and the, com the public and the commons, I hope we will hear more about this incredibly complex uh, subject in in these two days. Contradictions that is abound, and LK writes in the spirit of research, research on the contradictions and resolution of the contradictions. And I want to thank LK very much on behalf of the finer team for her contribution to our collective thought today and ask LK to, to come here <laughs> and talk to us. Thank you. So it's really hard to speak after such an introduction. I tell you, I'm so touched, I almost cried. Um, this uh, Angela, I, I would never have thought that you will introduce me and then in such a way. So um, I, 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 I cannot live up to this, um, that's for sure. Um, and I don't know how to start the presentation either. Um, so. Ah, oh, so that's what it looks like for me. Yeah. Okay, and then I go on like this? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, thank you, Karen, for inviting me. Um, we are new friends. We only met um, this summer in Freiburg at, uh, at the Biennale. That was the very first um, edition of this Biennale, and we spoke in outer space because we were still very much in the pandemic mode at the time. And we listened to each other speak, and that was a, a great pleasure and learning. And so that's why I think I was invited to, to join here. And, um, and I'm also super happy that old friends are here. So Shane van Heswijk, I have her book in my bag, so I will take it out later when it comes at the appropriate moment uh, in my lecture. And, uh, and somehow it had escaped me that Angela will be here, but that was like the the best, um, the best surprise um, ever. And we had just seen each other in Athens also at the beginning of the summer. So in a way, um, coming out of pandemic isolation but still thinking with the pandemic is very much part of what I'm sharing today, but also opening on to larger questions. And the first image uh, which you will be looking at or have been looking at is also one of the um, objects of inquiry that I'm looking at in the book that uh, Angela mentioned, uh, Living with an Infected Planet, um, COVID-19, comma, feminism, uh, so not COVID-19 feminism, but COVID-19 feminism, um, and the global frontline of care. Uh, can, can I ask a question? How many of you have seen this image before? So not everybody. So it's, I mean, it's considered a popular image, um, but, but I wasn't quite sure if, if everyone had seen it before. Um, and it's an image that deeply worried me, and I will explain why, and why it has a lot to do with the questions we are looking at here. Care, um, sociality, um, connectedness, interdependencies, and so on and so forth. So the original title of this painting is Game Changer. It, it's a 2020 painting by Banksy who donated it to Southampton General Hospital in Southern England, UK. The artwork depicts a boy playing with a nurse after selecting this new toy over superheroes Batman and Spider-Man who now find themselves in the bin. It was unveiled during the COVID-19 pandemic. It was then auctioned and then um, the proceeds from the auction were actually donated to the national health services that are not in a good state in the UK. And the nurse, uh, we can see her here with her uh, war uniform, um, represents uh, NHS um, nurses. Um, while the original um, was titled Game Changer, the online reproductions, and you can find them everywhere, on Etsy, on many other online um, places where you can buy posters and reproductions, 
the online reproductions of this, what I call new form of medical pandemic merchandise, um, circulated under names like Real Hero or Painting for Saints. And, and now comes the part that is maybe of interest in the narrower context here. Um, it was marketed as critical social art for your walls. Um, but what made me worry is that um, care was portrayed here as um, frontline service, um, as um, forcible militarization, if you will. And also what happens to the previous superheroes can of course happen to the toy nurse. Um, a hand that holds up someone is also a hand that has the power to drop someone in the bin. Um, and um, the other thing I would like to add is that superheroes are um, considered to be um, bodily superior. They don't sleep. Um, I think they don't eat much. Um, they can sustain themselves always. Um, I think they breathe, but I don't have deep knowledge of that. So, um, as we can tell, making them superheroes, the nurses, expects um, of them to overcome their own bodily dependencies and their own care needs. So these imaginaries of war in pandemic time defined care um, and healing and um, the global front lines of care produced a new form of militarization of care heroism um, that then was connected to these ethics of superhero sainthood. And I think this militarized visuality of care that was expressed in, in this image, but also in many others, is, is what um, left me very worried about the future of care and what, what this means in terms of expectations of people who are care workers. So we could say that from the invisibility of caring labors that have long been addressed in um, feminist uh, critical traditions and thought and political activism, uh, we have moved to the invincibility of care workers and we could say that made their condition worse, um, or I would argue that it made their condition worse. Um, this includes many things out of which I only list a few here. The silencing of their exhaustion and also the annihilation of grief and loss that carers experience when they um, lose the ones for whom they care. And here we could say uh, that there is also um, a need to look more closely at the lack of cultures of uh, practices of mourning as care. So care is very often described as something to do with life and life making. But I think it is also important, particularly in uh, times of uh, the pandemic um, and the sixth mass extinction, to think about um, mourning practices as um, caring practices. And also I think the pandemic, together with the geological era called the Anthropocene, uh, in which we know that we are living today, I think have in a way required of human beings to rethink how they understand what it means to be a human being. So, so on one hand, and this is in a way relating to care in a very complex way, so, so that humans are not these um, modern individuals and um, bounded um, beings, but very porous as, as all of us came to really understand in the pandemic. So, so all of us are connected by a breathing and an airborne pandemic makes us very aware that, that our bodies are constantly penetrated um, by things that we take into our body. Uh, but it also made us very aware that we, we as human beings are microbial beings, so that 99% of the DNA humans carry are microbial. So actually when we relate to each other, we also relate on microbial levels, but I'm not very sure how one actually does that. So I'm not good at it, that's what I'm saying. But I'm saying um, it's something that maybe needs to be understood better, how as humans we are also microbial, or mostly microbial. And then the other learning that, that in a way is required to take place in um, anthropogenic, so man-made, man with capital M following the 
diagnosis of anthropologist uh, Anna Singh um, as a geological force driving a mass extinction event. So, so between being a ge geological force and microbial, humans find themselves in a certain kind of confusion. Um, and this confusion is maybe best understood as, um, as human beings, as planetary beings, and, and asking what, what this will mean um, to become more planetary <clears throat> in relating to others that, that are not only human others. So I guess uh, responding to the title we were given and social uh, art practices, um, how does the understanding of being social change when one begins to more fully understand and feel that human beings are microbial beings, a geological force and planetary beings? And this is not so much an art historical question. I think this is very much a, a fundamental question. But I will share um, very recent um, art practices uh, in the second half of my lecture, which were shared with me by friends um, and colleagues, and I want to share them with, with you here today. So like Karen in her opening, uh, and maybe that's also an age thing, you know, the older you get, the more questions you have. So I have many questions, um, and I listed some of them here. How can one learn to be in relation with other living and non-living planetary beings? And I think this is a dimension of being social. How can one feel and practice such being in relation otherwise? How can one learn to take care of the relation through care, healing, and mourning? How can one learn to mourn the exhausted planet as a way of caring for planetarity? And how can one learn to imagine and make time for all that otherwise? And I think this very much resonates with what Angela Dimitrakaki said in her introduction, the relation between competition and care and how human beings have been, I would say, forcibly um, conscripted into very specific modern regimes of time that very much impacted on what we call social but also what we call care. Um, and and in, in this sense, I think it's very important to think about modernity um, not only um, as the production of new forms of domination over land, bodies, and territories, but as, of course, is well known um, over, over time. And in order to understand the effects, the afterlife of modernity, we have to look at the ways in which time was colonized. Today we live in a man-made geological era known as the Anthropocene, which I already um, introduced very briefly er earlier. Um, there's a very old book, uh, 1980. It has recently been retranslated into German last year, uh, The Death of Nature by Caroline Merjant. Um, and um, in her words, uh, this is the, the era of modernity is the time of the death of nature the historical period characterized by new forms of knowledge um, understood as science. And this science gave, as she argues, rise to new forms of domination based on the ideology of human exceptionalism. So which means that human beings are superior um, to all other beings. And it's exactly also the time, I can't go deeply into that now, but it's also the time in which uh, human beings were actually Per Linnaeus and his new taxon taxonomy inscribed into the animal kingdom, uh, but also though only those beings who have breasts, no? so the mammalian uh, beings, uh, and so we are mammals, uh, but, but only those beings um, that are female human beings are actually making the humans um, part of the animal kingdom, we could say. So, so we find the, the contradictions between care, domination, science, and the death of nature when we think about the kinds of sciences that um, arose during that period. And this science gave rise to new forms of domination based on the ideology of human exceptionalism, premised on independence and the silencing of interdependencies. And the, the other notion of thinking time, so not only like a historical understanding of how time was turned into the time of uh, modernity, um, but also the time scales human beings relate to or how social art practices could be um, of help to relate to planetary time scales differently. 
Um, most of the time, planetary timescales go unnoticed by human beings. Elizabeth Colbert, author of The Sixth Extinction and On Natural History, writes that geology, the science of Earth, holds that conditions on Earth change very slowly, except when they don't. And now we are in a period um, where the last half sentence applies to. So now um, change is rapid and, and can be felt and seen and maybe not well understood, but, but it is there and it is also as we are breathing and eating human beings in us. Two other books that I would uh, like to mention here, even though I cannot really do them justice in introducing them, um, is uh, The Climate of History in a Planetary Age by Deepesh Chakrabarti and um, the, um, uh, by Jan Sarasiewicz. Uh, he is uh, heading the Anthropocene uh, group um, of the Stratigraphic Society, uh, The Earth After Us, What Legacy Will Humans Leave in the Rocks, which, which in a way um, is, is maybe a different way of also thinking about how human time and rock time um, can be um, come together in, in different ways. The modern Western idea of human supremacy gave rise to coloniality, which is rooted in the twin ideologies of racism and speciesism. These ideologies of hierarchy and superiority led to a specific politics of biosocial violence that dispossesses life, considered less worthy of living. Genocide and ecocide result or resulted from the necropolitics of such speciesism and racism. And the scale of worthiness is the measure of extinction. That's what we could, uh, in a way, understand in retrospect. Today, one million species are threatened by annihilation, and humans are confronted with the limits of finitude antithetical to a modern sense of linear time premised on progress and futurity. There is growing awareness that the future is at risk and that today's planetary catastrophic conditions of loss and precarious futures are man-made. So what, what the, the worry, if we go back to this hero nurse at the very beginning, relating to human bodies at risk to die because they are exposed to a virus that results from the man-made conditions of humans encroaching on the territories of other beings that are called animals and then through zoonoses enter into human bodies um, is exactly the, the reason why relating to what we call <clears throat> life and death and time differently is I think at stake at, at this current moment. And I'm not arguing that it hasn't been at stake in previous moments of history. I think this has been um, maybe with human beings for a very long time, but it has been understood very differently in different times. Humans think and feel death and time through the lifespan of generations. That, that, that is in a way generally assumed. Many humans, um, so this is not all humans, but many humans do not have much practice in feeling the time span of rock formation or they, they don't have much practice in grieving the loss of billions of non-human beings, including vertebrates, invertebrates, and plants. Such enormous time spans and, and mass loss escape the tyranny of statistics and require different ethics of finitude based on a sense of ecological care and mourning. So the statistics I'm referring to here, maybe too obliquely, are these red lists of endangered species. And, um, and interestingly enough, um, these lists are based on, on a hierarchy. So, so birds and mammals are predominantly reg registered on the red list of threatened species of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, as opposed to other beings, uh, invertebrates, um, as systematic biologists, Robert H. Cowie, Philippe Boucher, and Benoit Fontaine pointed out in an article published in early 2022 in Biological Reviews. And so I think this is another, an other reason for deep worry that even during the ongoing mass extinction event, there is evidence for this continued speciesism articulated through vertebrate centricity. So, so the way in which we cannot feel close 
to other beings that, that are not mammals or birds, even though we are 99% microbial, is maybe something that, um, that um, is unsettling. So, so that is, in a way, one strand of investigation I'm thinking about um, at the moment. And, and the other, but connected to this, is how to make time differently. So, so in a way, there has been tons of literature on the social production of space following Henri Lefebvre, translated into English in 1991. But there has been much less on the social production of time and how actually time is not abstract, but made, produced, orchestrated, regimented, and so on and so forth. So in a way, uh, I would like to think more deeply about making time otherwise, beyond exhaustion, extractivism, supremacy, domination, and extinction. And maybe that's the optimist part that Angela spoke about. So I was surprised to be being introduced as an optimist. Um, I mean, I would say I'm not completely a pessimist. I would say I'm, and I share that with you, you are arguing for realism, so in a very different way. So, so maybe I try to be realistic, but on the optimist side. Um, and that would mean that making time for care, for social and emotional reproduction and bodily regeneration is actually taking a center in the societies that have to organize around that, so that's the, the optimist or maybe even utopian part, and also making time for mourning, grief, healing, and making time for um, recovery, and that refers also very concretely to feminist recovery plans that were written and envisioned um, during the pandemic. Um, so, so this is now. We are living in the aftermath of anthropogenic time where planetary responsibility and planetary care are in a way more required than, than we would have thought before. Um, but we are not, we as human beings are, are not there yet to fully be enabled to provide this planetary responsibility and care. Planetarity is a concept that was uh, first introduced by um, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak in 1997 in, 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 a, in, a, in a lecture she gave in Switzerland, and it was actually a lecture about Holocaust and commemoration, but in that context she first introduced, um, it, the lecture was titled Imperative to Reimagine the Planet. She, she first introduced this notion of the planet as opposed to the globe or globalization. The planet is here as perhaps always a catechesis for inscribing collective responsibility as right. And she emphasizes that right as responsibility can lead to a pre-capitalist mindset or to an aboriginal ecological practice of living where the opposition between the human and the natural is made indeterminate. And in a way that, that answers to, to the time of modernity that um, I spoke about um, in the first part of the lecture. And I also would like to, um, at this point, maybe, so, so John Toronto and Berenice Fischer are not the only care thinkers I think with, but they have been very important for the way in which I try to, to think about care. And so I wanted to, to, to use their work and relate it more deeply to planetary care, which uh, Joan Toronto has not been doing, but her, her work is open to that, I would say. So this quote, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, but, but nonetheless, it is being shown here um, again. Berenice Fischer <clears throat> was an educational scientist, and Joan Toronto is a political um, theorist and care ethicist, and uh, in 1990, they provided a very broad definition of care. They said that on the most general level, we suggest that caring be viewed as a species activity, and they talk about the human species, and I think this is the first uh, stop where I would make an annotation, because I would say there are many non-living beings and other living beings that are part of circles of care, and maybe their care is not um, done with the same intentionality human care is being performed, but we have to understand them as um, necessary to care, but also in a way as, as, as forms of care and providing care. 
And then um, the two authors, Fisher and Toronto, go on to write, so this activity includes everything we do to maintain, continue, and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves, and our environment. And I think this is where it becomes interesting, so that in 1990, they already spoke about the environment as um, this web um, that, they, that care seeks to interweave in, in, in a complex and, and life-sustaining manner. So, so caring and responsible planetary imaginaries may be the biggest challenge of what artistic and eco-social practices could contribute to at the moment so that these um, losses and needs can be imagined, felt, but also organized um, around them differently. And, and I would say that care is, um, as I said before, not only about relating to aliveness or, or keeping beings alive, but also to the um, toxicity of deadliness, um, otherwise we theorized under terms like necropolitics and necroeconomics, but also relating to loss and, and care as a form of mourning and being with the dead. So I think um, the time I spoke about before is then time to care, time to mourn, and connected to that time for thinking about futurity, which means that there is a future, so not taking the future for, for granted. Um, and in the second part, I, I want to share um, some artworks I have been very much touched by recently. And um, the first one is by Katarina Pieraksiku, um, and she deals with um, questions of land and territory uh, in the Sami territories. And um, I, I just met her really very recently, a few days ago. And, um, and this is a work called I'm the Last One Who Has Seen the River Alive, where she looks at Vattenfall's hydropower impact on the river in Jokmok, the municipality where she lives. And um, this was being presented in, in a very small um, installation, we can call it exhibition, where people gathered to have a conversation at the Geologische Bundesversuchsanstalt, so I'm trying to translate that. So that's the geological um, institution for carrying out uh, experiments, and Bund means federal, so it's the, the federal institution of that kind in Vienna where I live. It's very, very, very old. It goes back to the colonial imperial Habsburg, um, Austro-Hungarian Habsburg Empire. And, um, and they have all these remnants from the 1873 World's Fair there, which we are not going into today. But, but just to show that this is a very old and very imperial and very colonial um, institution. And so inhabiting such an institution with a small exhibition um, on um, questions of extractivism was not an easy practice, as the curator Karin Reisinger shared with us. And what I particularly want to underline is that Karin, um, in the subtitle for this project, spoke of material communities. So how, how bodies, uh, beings, natures, environments are come together on the level of materiality. And this was part of um, the currently still ongoing um, festival. It's um, called Wien Woche, so the Vienna Week. And um, this year, but also the following two years, it will be dedicated to working class ecologies, bringing together questions around uh, gender, class, and ecology in, in, in very direct ways. N not, not only, I mean only, not just with artistic practices, but also with a lot of um, direct action, ac activism, and working um, particularly on um, titles of residence and citizenship of care workers so that they can actually um, have legal rights to work and stay in, in the country where I live, in Austria. 
Uh, Jelena Micic um, used to be a student at the Academy of Fine Arts, that's how I met her, and she's curating this Wienwoche um, now. But I also want to share with you some of the work she's currently doing, um, which was shown in 2022 at Ulus Gallery in Belgrade, um, and um, what she did here. And I cannot do justice to these works. One would need hours to speak about them, because the complexity of research and investigation would just need much more time, but, but I nonetheless wanted to put them together to, to in a way start mapping how eco-social practices take on material form and at the same time invite people into environments. And maybe that's also a new way of working that social practice um, has so often been um, equated with things that are just performative and just with human beings in one space. So, so I guess I'm trying to challenge that a little bit. So her work is called Red Analysis, and um, she looked at Radinac in Serbia, that's um, um, a place where there is a steel factory that was owned by the US and now it's owned by China, and the 5,000 workers there really depend on this factory for their income. income. And, and she investigated what the iron factory does to the food, to the bodies, to the environment, to the dust. And she said, um, you could smell the iron when you entered the gallery. And uh, the material you see in the next slide, um, oh, you can't see it so well. So, so in a way, she soaked it in the iron mud there. So textiles were soaked in uh, the actual uh, material the territory consists of there, and then she exhibited that. For the um, vernissage, for the opening, um, she offered watermelons and uh, cherry, uh, cherry juice uh, from local cherry trees. But, um, so we might think, you know, that's just the color red, and she continues with this investigation. But um, actually, people didn't touch them. I mean, so they, they, they came from that place. So knowing that they are completely toxic, uh, people uh, were not so happy. So, so they looked at them, but they didn't dare to eat or drink them. So, so in a way, I think this is really a far extension from relational aesthetics and things we have discussed uh, many years ago. So she did an analysis of the toxicity of the dust together with local um, scientists and activists, an analysis of soil, water, and mud. And she soaked um, the textiles in the mud, as I said before. But she also created gatherings, bringing people together, um, understanding the condition in a different way. Um, so that's, that's why I wanted to bring this in here. The next example is um, by an Italian artist based in Brussels, Raffaella Crispino. It's a multifarious investigation she did, uh, starting from an oil painting of the abdication of um, um, Charles V, and then um, delving into questions of globalization, colonialism, botanical gardens around the world, a local brick manufacturer, invasive plants around her home, a group of women discussing feminism and the rise of capitalism. And again, so I have the book here. and I'm happy um, for you to take a look then. So um, again, one cannot do justice to these complex works uh, with a few words, but nonetheless, I think they also need to be shared in the form um, of lectures. So this is a botanical uh, garden in, uh, in Meise, and um, uh, Rafaela invited uh, three young women to engage and speak um, a script that she had written um, based on her engagement with um, the comments, um, Silvia Federici, um, but also the ways in which plants that are endangered to become extinct find new and unusual ways um, to reproduce. So, so in a way, that's what she uh, brought together here. Um, this is a um, coconut. Um, so at the greenhouse in the botanic garden in Meissen, the three young women discuss survival strategies of specific plants. They explore themes around Peter Kropotkin's theory of mutual aid. Contrary to the Darwinist hypothesis of the survival of the fittest, Kropotkin demonstrated that cooperation and mutual aid are the major factors of evolution and progress. And this is quoted from her 
book uh, that came out this year, Open Field 2022. Um, so she states, the coconut is large and heavy. To spread around the world, to spread around the world, it can float in the ocean for four months. It grows a leaf, which it uses as a sail to travel faster. So she investigated these kinds of maybe not, I mean, depending on where your field is. If you are a botanist, of course you know all this. But if, if you're not, you may not. So how to relate to plants and their knowledges and their, their modes of survival differently was one of the many questions she addressed in her work. Um, she writes, sea coconut is found only on two islands in the Seychelles. They are the largest and heaviest seeds in the world, each weighing about 18 kilo. 18 kilo, so imagine. I mean, so, like, I don't, I don't want to schlep 18 kilos around. Uh, sometimes we do luggage, 23 kilos maximum. But um, the, imagine wh who can carry such a seed. The kinds of animals that spread that seed around, they're extinct. We, we, we are well aware of that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. The theory is that in other times, they were eaten by giant animals that defecated them, allowing the plant to germinate elsewhere. With the extinction of these animals, the plant through its leaves developed a system of channeling nitrogen and phosphorus to feed the plants growing under mature trees. So maybe that's also the optimist part in Rafaela, to collect uh, stories like that, that are stories that have to do uh, with extinction imaginaries um, and imagining extinction beyond extinction, that it didn't happen, but may have happened at this moment in time. The next work is by uh, a dear friend of mine, Julia Stross, um, and this was shown at, and I also have to book here. This was shown in uh, the Martin Gropius Bau in Berlin in a project exhibition called Down to Earth, and it was supposed to be a um, zero carbon exhibition. So uh, here for people uh, who want to look at this, I'm also putting it out. And what we see here is the installation of the rainbow snake um, and uh, trans-indigenous assembly unplugged. Unplugged because the, there was, electricity was forbidden, so you couldn't show any films in this exhibition. And it was done in collaboration with a large number um, of people who did uh, the drawings, but also the shipibo embroidery, which um, um, the snake consists of. And I'm quoting things that she shared with me <clears throat> via email. Um, in Europe, the snake is described in the second Delphic hymn to Apollon as Python, whom Apollon has successfully pressed into the ground. But now the snake, um, so that's Julia's words, comes back from the earth into the exhibition space. And she says, Gaia hits back. Art returns to the polis, forgets narcissist individualism, and assumes a learning position. Snake is in the core of Vedic and Aboriginal mythology. So in a way, she, she explains why the snake was important to her here. The singing patterns were embroidered by the representatives of Amazonian Shipibo tribe, and um, she lists all their names, but she particularly, um, um, she particularly emphasized that this was also a way of sharing the resources that she had been given as an artist with the, 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 the money resources, because uh, due to the lack of tourism, nobody bought the embroideries these women make. So, so in a way, there is a lot of um, hidden economies um, behind that, that, that um, are not visible, that, that someone who just looks at the snake, we, we cannot see all this. So, so in a way, there is no way of understanding what it actually does. Um, and then she also explains that the snake was made with reused cloves, and uh, she explained um, the story behind this. We have criticized the environmental poisoning of the fashion industry. Visiting and interviewing the Berlin Stadtmission initiative, um, and the visit um, has revealed that 15,000 t-shirts were wasted because a client only needed 5,000, but it was cheaper to produce 20,000. And then people who buy these t-shirts uh, on the package, uh, they read fair um, fashion. 
Um, in such clothes, there are chemicals that are second worst after the atomic garbage, in, in Yulia's words, so um, I'm, I have to trust her here. Uh, we also criticize the megalomaniac chemical art industry with reused materials seen to radiate ecological beauty. So, so in a way, she also says that there is some kind of um, art washing going on. And these are cut out, very small cut out theaters that were embedded in the snake and that was her response to um, people not uh, being allowed to travel because of the zero carbon um, approach of the down to earth exhibition. Um, so she, she writes, I told the visitors about the situation of the queer or Aboriginal sister girls, and you saw them before in the cutouts, community living um, on the Tiwi Islands in Australia, which are threatened by rising seas. They have emancipated themselves from the conservative tribal structure by reviving the printmaking techniques of their ancestors and performing in their spectacular dresses, for example, at Sydney Pride. Or she told them about Maestra Justina, who in Peru near Pucarpa in the village of San Francisco is part of a self-organized school for the orphans of the Shipibo Conibo. So she explained, um, the conditions of a zero footprint exhibition, no electricity, no films. So these little theaters with the drawings became the stand-in for the screens. No flights, therefore, as she <clears throat> wrote to me, no real persons from indigenous communities. Separated by the colonial relationship of, and that's her words now, um, relationship of impossibility to bring them to the center of Western civilization, purist and moral Western civilization suddenly decides whether there is a budget for flights for them or not. Altars and drawings replace the screens for the film, trans-indigenous assembly, hence trans-indigenous assembly unplugged. And then the last sentence was, um, therefore the drawings are a solution to everything. Um, the, the last work that I would like to share with you is by Eliana Otta. Um, she currently does her PhD at the Academy of Fine Arts. Um, she lives and works in Athens and she's originally from um, Peru and um, the, the, the project that I want to share here is called Virtual Sanctuary for Fertilizing Morning. And it was uh, realized with, within this larger project uh, of seven prototypes for eco-social renewal um, titled uh, Driving the Human. And I also listed all the different institutions that came together in order to um, produce these kinds of works. Um, this is one, one image, um, and Eliana, who has worked on uh, the museum in Peru that um, um, commemorates um, the, the recent um, um, violence um, in, in her country, has now moved on to commemorate um, the violence of indigenous leaders, the violence against, uh, committed against uh, indigenous leaders who resist against extractivism and, and are being killed and murdered. So that's at the center of her project. And how to share this trends locally with people who are not there and to find um, digital ways of sharing and uh, making these, the current history um, known to, to, to people beyond um, local constituencies. Um, and she writes, while this continent begins to consider end of the world imaginaries, so this continent being Europe where she lives now, um, due to the global warming and COVID-19, in others peoples have faced their worlds ending for centuries while defending their lives and the deep webs of relationality that make them possible. In a period of crisis in civilization, I believe these are the peoples we must turn our heads to, paying attention to their knowledges, listening to their claims, learning from their practices, following their dreams, and honoring their deaths. And she writes that this is an initial phase, and she lists uh, those with whom she has worked together. Um, the contact has been established with the Ashaninka community in Nuevo Amana Ser Hawaii in central Peru, where the leaders Mauro Pio and Gonzalo Pio, father and son, were murdered in 2013 and 2020, respectively. This is where the images come from. So, so she acknowledges always each single image and where it comes from. Because when we think back of uh, Susan Sontag's regarding the pain of others essay, there, there is also a danger of um, instrumentalizing pain. 
so, 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 so very careful ways of dealing with mourning and death have to be um, developed. And I'm coming to the end. I wouldn't say a conclusion, um, but, but I'm approaching the, the end of this lecture. Um, so I feel that uh, there is really a deep need for new imaginaries understood following Judith Butler's social ontologies. And that in these imaginaries, care, mourning, and continuity and knowledge can come together in different ways. Um, care, I think, really tells us, so what we can learn from care are many, 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 many things. But the, the continuity is maybe the thing that the most recent pandemic has politically informed us about when the term essential critical labor, um, uh, system erhalt and the Arbeit was being introduced. And while there was a standstill rhetoric by the International Monetary Fund, um, others went into overdrive uh, in order to guarantee the continuity of care. And maybe our, so coming back to what Angela said in her introduction, um, that the history has been written as history of violence, war, and competition. Um, this also led to the annihilation of knowledge as care. And if knowledge had, care had been understood as a form or, or as something where knowledge comes from, maybe we would live in a very different world. Maybe, we don't know. But I think new imaginaries could explore that. Um, and I'm quoting Renzo Tadei in Everyday Matters Contemporary Approaches to Architecture 2021, who says something very similar to what I just said. The message from indigenous philosophies must be repeated. If it doesn't lead to the construction of relations of care, knowledge is equivalent to nothing. New forms of intervention then are desperately needed, interventions of another nature. We need to construct strategies and mechanisms for the scaling up of modes of existence in which knowledge and care are indistinguishable, no matter their origin. And uh, so coming back to these times, we are in a time now where the time of politics and the time of the planet once deemed, dis deemed distinct, I'm sorry, so a D is missing here before, deemed um, distinct are now colliding but not converging, as Claire Colebrook argues in um, her contribution to the book Anthropocene Feminism 2016. And so I, I asked at the beginning, what, how can human beings think themselves differently when they understand that they are microbial, um, geological force and planetary? And I want to uh, revisit the famous feminist uh, motto of um, the, the heydays of feminism in the second half of the 20th century, when people learned that the personal is political, and I want to add to that the personal so thinking of human beings as they are feeling themselves as being personal, is political, material, social, environmental, microbial, anthropogenic, geological, planetary, and you may add other things. So, so to understand the, the complexity of what it means to work with being human today. Um, and that's my last slide. So, so, so all summer thinking about COVID-19 feminism and care, I think the, the, the two methods in a way um, that, that emerged for me are both worry and hope. And they have a lot to do with the experience of care also where worry and hope are very close um, together. And so that's the, the, the toward the not yet, I borrowed from the, the wonderful book, um, to, the, toward the not yet, artist public practice edited by Shane van Hesleik, Maria La Vallo, I always stumble over the name, I'm so sorry, La, La Vallova and uh, uh, Rachel Rakes. And, um, I borrow toward the not yet as, as, as a way of thinking about um, futurity. But I would also say um, that we need a temporality together with those who are no longer um, with us beyond um, human beings. And with that, I would like to close.